keynote. Um, I'd like to welcome Professor Martin Weller, uh, who's going to be our keynote for this afternoon. Uh, professor Weller is a, is a professor of educational technology at the Open University. Uh, he's chaired the OU's first major e learning, learning course in 1999 that had 15,000 students. And he's been a director of both the VLE and Social Learn projects. He was also part of the team that won funding for the Open Learn project and is currently co PI of a Hewlett funded OER researcher. Uh, his research interests are in open education, uh, the impact of new technology and digital scholarship, and his latest book, uh, entitled Digital Scholar, was published by Bloomsbury under a Creative Commons license. Uh, and it's available upstairs in the bookshop. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and Professor Weller will be talking to us today about something that a lot of the, lot of the talks have touched on, which is the subject of MOOCs. Uh, and he'll be talking to us about surviving the year of the MOOC, the response to open courses. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, everyone can hear me okay? Yes, yeah, sounds like I'm okay. Uh, good. I was saying to Simon, the last time I was here at the University of Greenwich was 2005, 2006, and I'd just started blogging. I was excited to go to I've got a blog. <laughs> it was a new thing then. Yeah. Those were the days. Um, everyone knows what MOOCs are, yes? Does everyone know what MOOCs are? I can talk about MOOCs happening, but that's fine. Okay. Uh, so I've called this talk Surviving the Day or the Year of the MOOCs because it kind of feels a bit like that all this interest has come from outside about MOOCs onto higher education. But it feels like they're a bit like a, an alien invasion at the moment. I think they were on Newsnight last night. Did anyone see it on Newsnight last night? I didn't see it. But it had to get my blood pressure up. I saw it, I'm sure. So, uh, um, not doing so well on the technology, that keeps happening. So, what you get over here? Your mouse is as sensitive as mine. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, my, uh, my Mac was showing it in, in yellow. The sign was in Do you want to have a presenter? start from my kind of personal experience, broaden out a bit to think about design challenges of MOOCs and then sort of end by looking at the kind of bigger picture of MOOCs and higher education. Uh, I don't know about you, I, I come, there's not a day or a week goes by I don't read some kind of article about how MOOCs are going to sweep away all of higher education and, and I love MOOCs, I've kind of been involved in MOOCs for a long time, I'm big friends with the kind of Canadian guys who started it, it's beginning to get my nerves a bit and it feels a bit like this sometimes. Describe what the future of education looks like. MOOCs! Say MOOCs again! Say MOOC again! I dare you! I double dare <laughs> It gets quite sweary after that bit. <laughs> but some of you may have some sympathy with that. Um, so I'm going to talk about my experience of running a, a MOOC. So 8817 Open was a course I ran at the Open University. Um, it ran for seven weeks. It was part of a bigger master's course, and my, my block was seven weeks long. And it was about, op it was about openness education. So about a year ago, when we were writing, we said, oh, running as a MOOC, a kind of innocent suggestion. That was before kind of the spotlight of intensity kind of came out of MOOCs. And I, I came to regret that kind of glib suggestion. Because suddenly, it, it, people were getting sacked for going wrong with MOOCs. It was keeping me away. But anyway, so um, it was a mixture of informal and formal learners. So, my, so there's the master's course running with uh, master were OU students in, and we took them out of the VLE and they went into our open learning environment and mixed with anyone else who wanted to come along and study. Uh, so we ran it in our open learning environment, which was set up as a, a repository for open educational resources. So that was the, the big Hewlett funding project, and we've got like 10,000 hours worth of, kind of learning objects and stuff in there. Um, it wasn't really designed for MOOCs. Uh, I'll come back to that. Um, I set up three badges, so you could get, uh, you could earn these kind of digital Mozilla badges doing particular activities during the course. I had two uh, what we call social lecturers, tutors, moderating the forum, so I paid them some money to look after forums within Open Learn. Uh, my proudest achievement was I set up a blog aggregator, so I used WordPress. And so students had their own blogs, they, they, most of the solutions they had to post were on their own blogs, they kind of owned their own work. And then they had to register their blog with me, and I set up this WordPress blog, 
a little uh, add-in, a little plug-in called Feed WordPress, which then subscribes through all those other people's blogs and reposts them into one central blog. So that's kind of a way of bringing everyone's work together. Um, it was based around what I kind of called a collaboration-light activity-based model. So it's mainly about people having to go off and do stuff. Go away, research this, read this, produce this, and then blog about it. Um, but it wasn't kind of heavy-duty uh, collaboration. The work wasn't putting them into groups and getting them to work together, which is quite hard work to do on a formal course, when at least when you've got a tutor to put those people together. It's really hard work to do on a, a, a MOOC. Simon's got experience of doing that. He knows how hard work it can be. Uh, so this was kind of, I was trying to make, bring some of the benefits of, of them being networked together through the kind of blog aggregator and different formats, things like Twitter, without the kind of heavy-duty collaboration. So I started it on March 16th this year, so it's finished now. But um, unlike some of the other MOOCs that you might see in places like Coursera, I've kind of left it open. So it exists, so I'm trying to blur the boundary between what's a MOOC and what's an open educational resource. So you know, I would quite like it, you can take it and study it any time you want. So you could imagine um, so universities putting a group of people through it at any time they want to kind of staff development process to understand the open education. Uh, so, um, I used a mixture of technology for it, and that was deliberate. So there's kind of a mix between the student spaces and the course spaces. So uh, the, the, most of the content was in our open node system. Um, I used WordPress with a blog aggregator to bring all the students' blogs together. Um, I used we've got a system called CloudWorks, and I used that. To, that's got a really cool tool in it for allowing you to create a badge and set an activity to it. So that's what the tool I used to create these digital badges. Um, we had a number of online sessions that I used. We've got a, a version of Blackboard Collaborate, which many people have seen. Um, and I used MailChimp to send out a weekly email to uh, the students and the people who enrolled. So I'd get a, a list of people who enrolled and you can feed that through MailChimp and then send out a, a regular email. So I became a spam app, it's great. Um, surprisingly, that, that weekly email is probably the most important bit of technology in, in the whole movie, really. I think. So email is important. I mean, who knew? Um, then there's a the kind of student spaces, so students can use whatever blog and platform they like. I told them to go up, set up a free blog wherever you want, and that's got nothing to do with me, you choose a platform. I slightly regretted that advice about being so free and kind of that. So they, they might use things like Blogger, WordPress, Tumblr, whatever. Um, I thought there'd be a lot of discussion on Twitter, there wasn't actually, not many students use Twitter to discuss stuff. But a group of them did set up their own Google Plus community, and that was really active. And that Um, some of you may know the kind of distinction between MOOCs. People often talk about C MOOCs, and a lot of the uh, original MOOCs run by Canadians, mainly people like George Seaman, Stephen Downs, were based on this kind of connectivist model of uh, pedagogy. So they're kind of very distributed over lots of different technology, and they're kind of very much based on peer to peer association and stuff. And then the kind of X MOOCs are the things that are run by people like Coursera. These are kind of very linear, they're usually on one single platform. They're kind of high production, uh, video values, those kind of things. And often they kind of focus on one kind of, sort of star academic. Um, and people often kind of make this kind of binary distinction between the two. But I like to say my one kind of sat a bit in the middle. I had, had elements of both of them. So I was trying to make advantage of something kind of a distributed nature, but also it was quite a sort of linear approach and kind of following through. So, so I think you can have a mixture of the two. So some stats. Uh, I shouldn't really call it a MOOC because the, the, the M if, if probably stands for minor or moderate in this case. So I'm not getting the kind of 100,000, 50,000 people signing up for my MOOC. When, when I first um, said I was going to do it, I spoke to our communications team at the other university and said, oh great, we can let uh, all our alumni know. We send out a newsletter that's about to go out, that's going to go out to 500,000 people. I sort of felt slightly, slightly ill at that point. I thought I don't want 500,000 people piling onto my blog. So we kind of kept it a bit low key. So 239 people registered their blogs with us, so you didn't have to do that to do the course. I mean, we've got about 1,000 posts in that blog aggregator. Uh, 556 people enrolled, we didn't need to enroll to see the content, the content's kind of freely there. So we've had about 4,700 uh, sort of unique visitors to the, to the site, and weekly visitors sort of going that range, about 1,900 down to 450, 145,000 page views over the life of the course. Um, the last two are quite interesting. So we know we can track people when they come into OpenLearn, what they then go on to do. If they go directly from there on to register onto another course, we can track that. So we know we've got four registrations on other OU courses as a product of 
people coming to my MOOC, and nearly 50 prospectuses were requested. So you're beginning to get a sense maybe <coughs> MOOCs can work as a kind of a marketing um, thing there. So, uh, quick survey. Um, the numbers on this are rubbish. I mean, if you, know, if you think they've got like a thousand people kind of roughly registered, the returns to surveys and MOOCs are just awful. There's a good report from Edinburgh who ran a bunch of MOOCs with uh, Coursera, and that they make the point you know, by the time you have a big drop off of MOOC rates, then you, you get those people at the end to try and respond to a survey. You, you're really not getting much data at all. Uh, so I'm not going to make any big claims about this. We kind of, the average MOOC satisfaction rate of the first two agree that it's you know, satisfied with it would be somewhat, it's usually about 74, maybe about 78. You kind of done so much filtering by the time you get to that point, you kind of get the finishes. Um, demographics are the kind of age range you'd expect, nothing particularly surprising there. Uh, this is the kind of very typical MOOC drop off rate you see. It's the first one's daily visits, the second one's weekly visits. So you can see by the time you're getting into week three, you've pretty much whittled out the people who've signed up, come in, had a look, and then decided to carry on. So they kind of levels out to kind of get this. Like if they get past week three, they tend to stick with you. Um, so there's some technical issues. One thing is when you run a MOOC, you really learn a lot about your, uh, your technical platforms you've got in your university or, or your own technical knowledge. Um, I timed it really badly. We just relaunched the, the open learn platform and they've got a, a Drupal back, no, a Moodle back end talking to a Drupal front end and in between those two systems talking to each other there's like a, a time lag, lag of about sort of 20 seconds like, trying to load pages, 20 second load page on the internet like infinity, you know, so speed was an issue. Um, it was difficult to enroll in the course, partly because that wasn't what our platform was really developed for, so it wasn't really developed for to enroll in the course. Um, I'll show you the site in a minute. The screen real estate was taken up by too much other stuff. Because part of what our, what our open end platform was developed for is people find a particular resource that come in and then we're trying to send them elsewhere. And have a look at this course, go and do this. Because you don't want to do that when you're in a seven week long move. You kind of want to use that, that real estate for things about the course. Uh, and simply the navigation didn't quite work, didn't break down from that. Um, so I simply used this cloud work system to give out these digital badges. It worked okay, but it was a bit clunky, and at one point it wasn't giving people feedback when I rejected their badge. Sometimes they would give them the wrong link to the badge, it needs to link to the right bit of evidence. So I was rejecting it, but they weren't getting feedback. It was kind of um, so I said to students, when they, they register their blogs with us, then I have to add them into my blog annotator. And I thought I'd have this lovely, magical way of doing it. It would detect their RSS feed, and we'd automatically add it in. Oh no, so, no I couldn't do that, so I had to add in to all those, wherever it was, 300 blogs manually, so every day I was going in and find who's, who's registered their blog with them, find the RSS feed, copy and paste it in, so that was a bit of a pain. And lastly, I said um, I let people choose whatever blog platform they want. Now, for feed WordPress to work, it needs to find an RSS feed that comes a subscription feed. Um, now, some blog platforms kind of hide that away in the most obscure places, which kind of like a real piece of detective work to try and find the RSS feed. So um, that was a real pain. So if, if I can't find the RSS feed, I can't syndicate it into my book. Um, for the learners, I think there were some issues. Um, they weren't sure how to connect with others, so um, I was saying to them, go and comment on other people's blogs. And people say, I've just written a lovely long blog post, and no one's commented on it. You know, so they need to learn ways of getting other people to reciprocate on their own blogs. Um, People talked about information, even though my course wasn't massive, they talked about information overload, and particularly going to that central blog aggregate, and suddenly you'd get like 30 posts come through in one go. Am I meant to read all of these? Um, my course is very much about being open, I'll try and encourage them to become bloggers and to be active participants. But that isn't, you know, and I think we can make sort of glib statements about that, being open is good. But, you know, I had one student said to me that she had problems with being cyber-stalked in the past, you know, she felt like she was being forced to be open and that was very uncomfortable for her, so there are issues around that thing. Um, pacing and content, uh, this is a master level course, it's meant to be sort of 16 hours a week, now that, that's a big chunk for me, but most groups are sort of about a three hour a week commitment, so it's a big chunk for her. Um, 
But what I did was they, the, those activities, there would be about four activities a week, and they're largely independent of each other. So I was saying, so if you're struggling, just concentrate on these one or two activities a week and sort of and do it that way. Um, I think for a lot of learners, they were coming to it with, I wouldn't say the wrong metaphor, but metaphors that didn't work well for them. So I mentioned you might get all those posts coming through um, on the blog aggregator, and some said they felt like a teacher who's got 50 essays to mark. And I was trying to say, that's probably not the, a useful way to think about it. Or something. I was trying to give them metaphors that would be helpful. Like imagine it's a, a stream that you come into every now and then just dip into it, just kind of take some from it. But I think we kind of need to help people with those, those metaphors. So coming from formal education systems, it's often books are, are different. To um, so what worked? I think mixing those informal and formal learners together did work. There wasn't kind of little ghettos or cliques or anything for me. Uh, I'm a big fan of the blog aggregator. I think it's a really good way to kind of surface the work that students do, but also allow them to still own their own work and that they can then carry on after the course is finished and still be become active bloggers and they're part of the community. Then. I mentioned the weekly email, that was really important. I think um, some courses that I've seen, some groups, they, they do a daily email. Daily email is too much. If I haven't read Jesse's email, I'll get another email in that comes to add to that feeling of overload. But a weekly email that's kind of encouraging and sort of helps them decide what they need to do for that week, it's just about one, I think. Um, I, I allowed quite a lot of flexibility, so I was like, well, don't worry if you haven't done, you know, we're now going into week three. If you're still on week one, it doesn't matter, you can do these things whenever you want, whenever you want. Um, but some books are kind of quite strict about that. You kind of have to pass the test on Friday night to get access to the next week. Weeks work, and that works for some people. You know, that kind of strong motivation to finish that. Um, the activity-based approach I think works, and having those things as sort of slightly independent, so people could almost pick and choose which ones would be interest to them. Uh, badges, I thought badges were quite kind of trivial, really. Basically, I said to do an activity, there are three activities to do, and post your solution. And I would look at it, and as long as it looked roughly about right, I'd give them the badge. I'm not giving them a score or anything, so kind of feedback. That was decent and badge. Um, so I thought people are dismissing as being trivial, but they really liked them. They're kind of a real strong motivator for people. Um, I ran three live sessions uh, on the course. Uh, one was a, a talk from George Seamans, one was a, a kind of wrap up session for me, and one was a kind of group session where I got them to kind of talk about stuff. And although only about sort of 30 to 100 people turned up for each one, and we recorded them and put them up live afterwards, I think people, it's been kind of like, car breakdown insurance. I think people liked knowing they were there, so that they were quite popular, I mean, just for existing. Um, so what I'd do differently next year, I wouldn't put it on the same platform, I don't think that worked particularly, but we've got another platform, which is kind of the only one to have. <coughs> so. um, I, I think I just assumed that the Twitter community would take off, but it didn't, I think I need to do more about that. So the first week, have a simple activity, you know, post a solution, put something on Twitter that links to your solution and, and use the hashtag get them to kind of start connecting with each other really early on. Uh, and related to that, give them some advice on, on how you engage with other things in that community. So, so, so I said to them one week, you know, just choose three blogs at random and go over and leave a comment on their posts. And then that way you're forming connections between people that they might come back with. So I think you need to help them get to that stage where they can get others to, to feed around each other. Otherwise it feels like you're kind of blogging in isolation. I think I'd do more live sessions and say they were popular. Um, I think I'd limit the options that I'd give them on what blog platforms to use. And if I said use uh, Blogger, WordPress, or Tumblr, you know where the RSS feeds are with that, so I could set up an automatic script and say this is where the RSS feed is, instead of me spending ages sort of hunting around. Um, I think the content kind of stands pretty well. I'd update, you know, the, a lot of content talks about MOOCs, and I think MOOCs change every week, so I need to update it, but largely they were okay. Um, I was a bit nervous in a couple of solutions, uh, the activities I asked them to produce multimedia solutions, kind of things like presentations or videos. And I was a bit nervous about that, that maybe I'm asking too much of them. But actually, that those ones that I thought were the best rather than kind of more textual ones. I think there might be more of those. I think that allowed people much more freedom and that they could share the stuff around. So I think I do more of those. Um, so, what I learned from that session was. Uh, MOOCs are really hard work. You know, we were testing a lot of systems at the OU that weren't really built for this purpose. It was kind of to advise lots of ways of working kind of on the fly. They're also pretty scary. You know, I sort of woke up in the middle of the night quite a few times. Uh, there was a, a big disaster at Georgia Tech, I think. So, so uh, the University of Georgia Tech and the states ran a MOOC and it crashed on the first day. And 
the blogosphere was kind of like, these idiots don't know what they're doing. You kind of, and if you, if you fall over on a MOOC, you're doing it publicly. You know, if you make an idiot of yourself, the lecturer will kind of, not many people know about it. And so the, I did kind of wake up with palpitations a few times. <laughs> I don't want to do a MOOC. Um, but, I, but MOOCs, it was really fun actually. You know, I think it's the most fun I've had sort of doing distance education for a long time actually. It was you know, really good. It was, it was seat the pants stuff, but you know, good, good stuff. Um, and it also comes to me that it kind of re reinforced my belief in the open approach, that that mixture of technologies I used rather than just give them all over to one MOOC provider. And I feel quite strongly about students only in their own spaces in this kind of area. So they own their own blogs, and that it was their material rather than them submitting it to me and us keeping it. And I'll come on to that because that's kind of a big issue. Uh, okay, <coughs> this is going to work with the tricky mouse. Um, I won't jump out. I've, um, I was going to show you. So one of my students at the end, they wrote a lovely poem on, uh, on Prezi. You flow through which is a lovely poem. Which is uh, Danish or something. It's a slightly lovely accent. I won't show you. I'm going to try find it all over. Everything else. But you don't get that in a convention, of course. People write in poems and post them online, for us. Yeah, so and you do get a sense that, you know, the, particularly the, the informal learners, the kind of open learners, are really appreciative found it really good, they've been part of a community and they're still kind of using that Google Plus community to share stuff with each other. Uh, so, coming up my funnel, out my funnel, uh, the next thing I thought, so some of the design challenges, and sort of four design challenges that I think my experience raised with me that I think are kind of applicable for all moves. The first is that how do you do the kind of support stuff? The reason moves are cheap free and open is because uh, we've taken all the costly stuff, the, 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 the human support. And so how do you replace that? So you can do it in another way, you can try and encourage peer-to-peer -peer support, all that stuff I was talking about, trying to get them to comment on each other's blogs, those kind of things. Uh, some people think Coursera are trying to have this idea of community champions, people who maybe did the MOOC before, get them to come back as, as community champions next year and on it. Um, you can't go down the, the paying route, you know, you to get big money to pay two moderators to run. At least the four of those have been open there to kind of keep in mind those. Now, you can get your platform to do quite a lot of this for you. This some, I'm doing a bit of work with uh, the future learn people who are developing a MOOC platform at the moment. I'm trying to think how much. For instance, you can have system, some systems will, you can do peer assessments. You can tell them you've been allocated this person to go and look at, go and look at their, their solution and, and give it a mark, and then you'll, you'll get marks the mark you give it. Or you can use analytics. And, these are number of people who are similar to you. You put people into groups that might have similar interests. So a lot of the technology can do some of that work for you, some of that kind of support work. Uh, I think you need to kind of encourage self-help, you know, just, just Google it, kind of that approach. Um, George Seamus, one of the, the godfather of MOOCs, gave a talk for me, and he was saying that his experience, it's the kind of self-motivated learners who do best in, in MOOCs. So if you don't know how to do something, go off and find out how to do it. I think we, we can encourage people to do that. And just simple things like, you know, we had there was a hashtag associated with my course at hash 817 open. So if you're just putting anything out on, on blogs or on Twitter, just use the hashtag and other people will find you. It's kind of a good way to get them to, to build that community very easily. <coughs> you know, obviously scale is the big issue. So I had probably sort of less than a thousand people and I tried to the less than that, you as the individual, you can still go around and do quite a lot of work in building that community. So, particularly as they were posting their first blog post that was coming in as a blog aggregator, I was sort of going over and leaving a comment saying, Welcome on board, lovely post, we'll see you over to try and build some of that kind of sense of community. But if you get more than a thousand people, you can't really do that. So, okay, okay, there's too much work for you to do that. You know, it's much more of a, a broadcast for all of them. And also, I think for students, if they're sharing content, then if you've got more than a thousand, a thousand is a pretty arbitrary figure. It's not like nine is fine, a thousand is fine, it's trouble, but about that kind of number, it becomes too much. There's too much content if you're getting them all to produce a solution. You know, here are 20,000 solutions. Who are meant to look at, who are meant to look at in those things? So, how do we help people find each other? <coughs> clever ways of doing that? Is it just kind of random? You just try and find people that are similar to you? And how do you help them cope with over? I think sometimes that's a technical solution. Maybe you only get to see so many, but it might also just be, as I was saying earlier, about the idea of giving the right metaphors and work. It's 
this different sphere. Um, motivation is really interesting, I think. You know, you're getting learners with quite different motivations here. So, um, at, at the Open University, we've always had what we call leisure learners, but I think you get a lot more of MOOCs. People just come along to have a look. You get people who just want to see, see if they're interested in MOOCs. You even get people come along who know they won't like the course and want to tell you how much they don't like the course. So, <laughs> which they can't do if they're paying, you know, if you're paying £9,000 a year, that's an expensive hobby to have, but you can do it with a MOOC. <laughs> so, get learner trolls. Um, so I think having key achievements along the way really helps. Out. So I have these three badges: sort of one of week three, one of week five, and one of week seven. So it's kind of enough to kind of keep you going. I think I probably get more of those because um, MOOCs do have this big high, this kind of high drop-off rate, and, and I'm quite worried that I think you know, for a lot of nervous learners, they, they might think, "Oh, MOOCs are really good way." I'm not sure I want to sign up for. A, Full degree, they'll try and move. If they drop out of a move, they sort of go away with a sense of failure. It's like, I failed even at a secondary course. I think so. If you can give them some rewards along the way, I think that helps with that kind of sense of purpose and achievement. Um, I went to sort of highlighting life activities. So I'll say to them, if there are four activities in a week, these are the two you should really concentrate on because they're the kind of key ones. I think that helps learners not to kind of feel completely overwhelmed. Um, I allowed catch up, but some people kind of go out and strip to group. Um, and getting the, the tone right is, is, is really important. It's kind of quite an informal tone. So that weekly email is kind of slightly jokey and stuff. You know, so when I said about having those, those long page low times in the system, I told them that that was a, an inbuilt feature to allow time for reflection. So they were like, okay. <laughs> but that kind of thing, so getting that tone right and letting them feel that you're part of that community with them. Um, so, uh, something I didn't do here, but kind of end of course assessment, you know, can they take away is there a test at the end, you take away a nice sort of certificate, so is there something really worth kind of going for at the end. Um, and lastly is this idea of identity. Um, so in some MOOCs, there's a, some people might know, there's a MOOC in, uh, in the States called DS106, it stands for Digital Storytelling, um, and it's kind of like a, a phenomenon really. So, uh, where's my laptop? So on my laptop, I've got a DS106 sticker. I sometimes go to conferences and see other people with DS106 stickers. It's kind of like a badge that you recognise. So there's a real kind of sense of community around that MOOC, and it goes far beyond the, the MOOC itself. Um, a lot of the kind of Coursera MOOCs are based around the idea of, sort of learning at the foot of the masters. So the kind of the, the identity of the courses you're going to Sebastian Thrun's course. He's the expert. <coughs> Um, this idea, you know, does, does the identity go beyond the MOOC? So you might have people discussing stuff and sharing stuff in Twitter, which is completely outside of what they're formally required to do within the MOOC. It's like the, the MOOC hashtag becomes a badge of that community. Um, and another issue I think is we need to be quite upfront about the kind of contract we've got with learners. So if you are being experimental, you need to set a big flashing warning light in front of them. We're trying some new stuff out. I think that's okay to do and we should do that. It's a different contract, you're not paying money, you are asking the time. So it allows you to be experimental, but they should know if you're trying to be experimental. So, so I think one way to think about it often is to think if you were starting a MOOC, how would, what would you say in your opening email to the students that kind of get across the identity of that course? Okay, so onto the, uh, onto the kind of broader picture. Um, despite what you might think from reading some of the online stuff. MOOCs didn't come from nowhere. They kind of didn't just appear overnight. And there's a really uh, nice um, image in this report uh, that sort of brings together some of those influencing factors. The kind of just the general open education trend that's been going for many years. Uh, things like Open Learn that we have at the OU, all this kind of open educational resource movements, some of these early MOOCs, they all kind of like feed into each other. We've all been sort of developing these trends. So they haven't just come from nowhere uh, overnight. Um, so open education has kind of been my thing for a long time. It feels like at the moment we're in, that there's a battle for the, for, the, for the soul of open education. It's not to be too much. Right? Um, so the, you know, calling things MOOCs is it, quite controversial often because um, often they're, they're free, but they're not really open. So, for example, I can't go, I can't see a Coursera material unless I sign up for it. I can only see it when it's being run. So I can't just go and access it whenever I want. I certainly can't take it and reuse it elsewhere, so 
where there's a lot of open educational resources, the idea is they've got a, a, an open license, usually a Creative Commons license, that says you, you can take this material and you can adapt it and reuse it and put it into your own rules. And you certainly can't do that with MOOCs, so we're not open in that sense. There's some really interesting developments now. So people like Coursera announced a couple of weeks ago that actually what they're going to do is start delivering e-learning content on a platform on campuses. That's not really, that's not really the future of that. That's, that's just being Blackboard or Pearson. So actually they decided that, I think it's probably due to their venture capital, so some return on investment. But um, the real money is in existing education. So suddenly they're kind of coming that the different. I think that's got very little to do with MOOCs. Um, and a kind of meme idea, a theme you'll often see is this idea, it's sort of trotted out almost as if it's completely uncontroversial that education is broken. We can start with that point. Education is broken. And what they usually mean is, and I've got the solution to set in my back pocket, I was saying. So we can challenge that whenever you see it. So it's kind of a, a particular narrative that's been set up. Um, and we begin to see these kind of narratives emerge that begin to exclude higher education from, from the MOOC story. So, uh, Donald Clark did a blog post the other day, he was going about how it, it took an outsider like a Khan Academy to come along and change higher education. It really kind of ignores all the history of all those things that I just showed in the previous diagram, like open educational resources, MOOCs that were coming out of universities, because that kind of doesn't fit in with the kind of sexy venture capitalist story that they're trying to tell. So this is the, what the kind of the simple ways, it's the Silicon Valley narrative. <laughs> Education is broken, we all know that. Um, MOOCs are the answer, that's obvious, isn't it? And oh look, we can sell you MOOCs. Simple, you know, and then before you know it, it's, you know, they're in trouble. As a matter of fact, I've got so fed up with it, I've started a tumble. So I collect together all examples of where people are saying education is broken. There's a fantastic piece uh, by Sebastian Thrum, who's the guy who set up um, Udacity, did the big. Uh, the first big MOOC, so 100 first big MOOC. And you know, the title is, um, high, it starts off from saying, higher education is broken, it needs some Silicon Valley magic to fix it. And that's the kind of premise for it. It's like, it reads almost like a parody. And, and Thrun has said things like, in the future there will be only 10 global providers of education. So there's kind of a real sense that MOOCs are going to replace higher education, and it's kind of almost uh, goes without that saying. So if you do send these examples of these things, let me know. Tweet me or whatever, collect them into my, my time. Um, and the interesting thing is like, how much does support matter? How much does it cost? So I've deliberately removed the, the, the money from the side, so I'm not saying how much it costs. So I've taken this from some of the relative costs over the, uh, an eight year life cycle of a distance learning course at the Open University. So production and then presentation. So the big sort of cream bar is tutor costs. That, so if you take that out, of course you can do it cheap, because that's the stuff that really costs money, it's paying people money to support the students. And the green bar will be at the top, even that, I think that's things like help desks and all that stuff. So the big question I think for education is how much does that matter to students? If they don't want it, that's the bit we're charging them for. And of course MOOCs can do both that, that's what they do. So it's easy to produce a course cheaply and sell it cheaply if you're not doing that stuff. But I don't send down on MOOCs, I may send a bit down on MOOCs, I'm not really, I think they're really interesting, and so I've been involved with them for a long time. But I think what's really interesting about them is they make us ask questions of ourselves on education, such as, what's my stance on openness, what do I believe about openness in general, open access publishing, open scholarship. In fact, can we make our curriculum more flexible? Could we do things like, well, these MOOCs over here we think are really good, and we'll accredit those. If you study any of those MOOCs, and you can prove that you've passed it, We'll only test credit for that when you come into university. Could we team up a bunch of universities together and say, look, we all teach statistics, you know, level one course, why don't we just create one big MOOC and put all our students in? So we could do kind of different things in that group. Uh, this idea of using badges and those similar things, kind of small achievements along the way, so that might be interesting approach to go. Uh, we created a, a MOOC out of some existing maths materials we ran in, in the States for. Uh, people who kept struggling, they kept kind of dropping out of college so they couldn't pass their maths exam. We kind of created a move out of our OU material. But we, um, we recast it as, as a bunch of badges along the way. And the person who had written the original course did that, sort of recasting it. 
there's a really interesting way for him to think about the course, to kind of think of it in terms of rewards that you post along the way. And one thing we're really interested in is sort of doing this bridge from informal to formal learning. At the moment, it's, you know, it's quite a big step jump. You're doing nothing and doing a three year degree. And it's whether we can kind of smooth that curve up and try them a few loops and maybe get some credit for them and then move into formal education. Uh, and it really just, I mean, it's like, you know, can I use that technology? What are you using there? Can we do some more stuff like that? How, how can I use particular technologies? Blogs, words. Um, I didn't use much of it, but the, kind of, a lot of the automatic assessment, because you take away that human support, so like the, the Coursera type blogs use automatic assessment, is actually really good actually. It kind of gives you good feedback to students. I think we shouldn't dismiss that. But that's, that's really good. But finally, people are actually interested in learning. I said to like, for years we've been banging on about this stuff, and then MOOCs come along and suddenly, well, we're not from vice chancellors, you know, suddenly going, tell me about MOOCs. I'm trying to tell you about either, I'm afraid, but I've been working with a bunch of academics who are putting some stuff into the future learning. And they're kind of really excited about it. You know, I've been trying to get you to engage with e-learning for years. <laughs> but I'm not going to moan for it. Um, but so, so I think some MOOCs are really good in that sense. They've kind of finally got people to engage. They've kind of pushed e-learning forward a few years ago. So that's really good. So, uh, MOOCs and higher education. I think we can, MOOCs are our friends. We don't need to, think, we don't need to fear them. Uh, but only if we answer those questions on the previous slide can we do all those things. I think it's, it's fatal to ignore them. Uh, but at the same time, there's a certain sense of panic at the moment. People running around it's like, 16 hours. Well, <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, can somebody do something about bloody moots? Who can do something about bloody moots? It's kind of big panic. Um, and if we're going to carry on, presumably we are doing our kind of supported learning, we have to make sure we really make the case for that, that big cream bar. That's the bit that people are panicking for. So we have to make the case for why that's worthwhile. I think it's important to understand that this is quite a crucial time. It's kind of a fascinating time to live through. Um, you know, I've seen so much change over the past few years, so much kind of sudden hype about all the things that, that are interesting. Uh, that it's, we have to say this is kind of a crucial time. Um, decisions we make now, things we don't do now, might well have kind of repercussions later. So, closing thoughts. One more time. Uh, you can kind of see MOOCs as one particular, at the moment they're just they're the kind of front line in this battle for openness, but they're not the only thing. Kind of openness has been a trend in education, so you could also think about open access publishing as kind of being a similar thing. At the moment there's a kind of struggle going on between um, what we might want to think of as kind of altruistic or the interesting or experimental nature of openness and the kind of more commercial type. Um, this is my thesis. Uh, the battle for openness is really a proxy for the battle for the future of education. You know, so you saw my Silicon Valley kind of narrative. You, you can see how that and MOOCs allow that to happen. So MOOCs are the kind of the Trojan horse of bringing that in. Um, so I think the worst thing we can do now is say MOOCs, what are we just ignore them. We need to engage with them and say what our response is and make sure that it's kind of the case for higher education. What it means. So we don't.